Hi, everyone. So here we are for another exciting seminar. I hope that your Friday is going well. We are extremely lucky to have Elizabeth Whitlow from the Regenerative Organic Alliance, who's going to be speaking with us today on a lot of uh, her work in the organization's work, specifically related to the new Regenerative Organic Certification. And so this is going to be a really great presentation that's going to build on some of what the group learned when we heard about the really the grassroots movement to start the organic certification um, in Washington and along the West Coast. And we'll get to see how that's evolved um, over the last couple of decades and has led us to this point now with the regenerative organic certification. So I'm going to pass it along to Elizabeth and we will get started. Thank you so much. I am delighted to join you all. I was just commenting uh, over the syllabus and how great it is and how I wish I could go back to school. We know and, one of two, uh, one of them yeah. mentioned. And so then it's- Please mute yourself. Please mute yourself right um, now. I have a question on Please that. Because in the slides- and then we're no. um, <laughs> you have to mute everybody, all. right? <laughs> We've got so many folks in the session yeah. right now that it's hard to find. Oh my gosh. Uh, so anyways, Elizabeth, I really um, apologize. No worries. You don't call people up like and, and call their names when you see their mic on, do you? No, it's not, not um, the way to go. Okay, I was just curious. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I am envious of the, of course, you all are undertaking looks like some really great certification programs you are looking at and many of which I'm very familiar with after spending over 20, gosh, 25 years now, I've been working in different types of agricultural certifications. And um, I got my start up in Washington. In fact, I did my master's at Evergreen and um, it was there over a late night cup of coffee discussion debate with some colleagues uh, about whether the certification was meaningful. And it got me started on this pathway of looking at uh, shade grown coffee at the time. It was, um, you know, late 90s and coffee was just becoming a really important uh, kind of world for certification, especially up in the Northwest where a lot of it was consumed. So um, it led me down to California and I am zooming here today from Northern California, the land of the coastal Miwok and the Southern Pomo. And I am um, here on their land and um, broadcasting to you to share with you some of the information about the uh, Regenerative Organic Certified Program. I'm gonna try to play a video, so just bear with me a moment and we're gonna see if this video will start because this there's some really great visuals and gives you a good idea of kind of the richness and the contextual nature of a regenerative organic farm. There's so much complexity to it and um, it just comes to life beautifully. These are some of the earlier founders um, who joined in beginning this um, program. So just give me one minute. Let's uh, move this to slideshow and I'll see if it'll play and make sure you can hear it. Uh, so sh let me know you want a thumbs up if you can hear it. Perfect. This is only two minutes. Oops, I did that. Um, I don't think any of us can hear the video. Oh, you can't. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Stop right now. Okay. I wasn't sure if you would be able to hear it. There's somebody needs to put their mute on. And we'll get through all these technical difficulties here today. I'm looking at 
Yeah. Okay, so um, you should be able to see my main slide, and I'm talking over somebody who needs to mute again. Like ninety percent people. Oh, and let's see. Okay, sounds like they're muted. So I'm sorry that video you can't hear the audio. <clears throat> it's, it's unfortunate. You did see some of the visuals, and so I'm just going to jump into the regular presentation here that gives you the background on uh, the Regenerative Organic Certified Program. And uh, what I'll do is, is basically tell you kind of how we're defining regenerative, who is behind this, um, how we're doing it, um, where we are today. And um, I did include some slides. I don't know if we want to get quite as detailed, but um, I did include some of the slides on what it requires for the certifiers who are sending auditors out to verify this, just because of the level of uh, that you all are undertaking here in your class, it seems like that might be useful information, but um, we'll see how the time goes. That's not something I would normally include in a basic introduction to regenerative organic certified, but I think you all are um, certainly at a more advanced level. Um, so first I wanna start uh, recognizing that regenerative organic agriculture is a collection of practices and they focus on regenerating soil health and looking at the full farm ecosystem in, in a very holistic sense. Um, I would also call out to the fact that indigenous people have been practicing regenerative for millennia. It was only within the last 70 years of the advancement of industrialized chemically based agriculture that we started destroying the soil on which we all depend. So in practice, regenerative organic agriculture can look like the use of cover crops, crop rotation, low till, um, zero use of persistent chemical pesticides and fertilizers, and then layering onto those practices, depending on that farm's needs in that particular place, in the um, in its in that microclimate by that the cultural practices in that region, you layer in other practices that could be like adding perennials or practicing agroforestry um, or vegetative barriers or other types of regenerative practices. Um, integrating animals is a really big one, but really to be truly regenerative, um, the way we see it here is that a system, a farming system needs to consider all the living entities in that farm system from the soil microbiome to the animals, to the workers on the farm and looking at farmers as the stewards of the land and stewards of community. And so um, just in advancing this type of agriculture, we can completely change the director of our future. And um, there's a lot at stake now with IPCC scientists predicting that we've only got 60 or 70 harvests left. So it's the time is now, it's urgent and there's, there's really no time to wait or think about it a little further or further argue about how we define it. So in that, for that reason, the Regenerative Organic Alliance, the founders came together in 2017, 18. They started to see what they saw as a weakening of the federal standard for organic. And I noticed on your syllabus, your last uh, recent class was the mainstreaming of organic. And Having worked in organic for 17 years, um, I, I've seen that right up close and it is it has happened. And for that reason, the founders of this organization, it includes Patagonia, the clothing company also has a little known food division, uh, Dr. Bronner's beloved iconic soap company um, and the Rodeo Institute. And these are all organizations that had organic as part of their DNA and they still have organic as their DNA. And we all still see organic as the, the highest level we can get um, uh, on a food label until we came up with the regenerative organic certified label. So those three entities came together, they're the founders, they brought in other experts and uh, in, in ranching, one of them, it was in that video, Will Harris, um, the people from the biggest little farm, other groups that were working on fair trade, social justice, um, animal welfare, and, um, and that's how they came together to hammer out their vision for a future of agriculture. And um, what, where it starts with is the soil. And this quote from J.I. Rodale has been repeated for many years. Um, George Washington Carver before Rodale also was noting the same thing. Healthy soil equals healthy food equals healthy people. 
The soil health is intrinsically linked to the total health of our food system. Um, just in the time we've been talking, six and a half minutes since this slideshow has been running, or this PowerPoint, we have lost the equivalent of around 210 soccer fields of soil to topsoil erosion, losing 30 soccer fields a minute. Elizabeth, so, I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but um, if you, you do have a PowerPoint. Um, I think the participants cannot see it on our end. Are you serious? Let's see. That is unfortunate because I've been going through each of the slides. I'm uh, really grateful that you told me that. It must be something to do with that video. So let's see. Okay, my share is off. I'm going to start it again, okay? And, and um, thank you for chiming in there. Just let me know if you don't see the um, PowerPoint with um, J.I. Rodeo. You're all set now. And Robert Rodeo. Okay, so then I'm going to just move it to the, um, from the current slide. Okay, so you should be able to see the full screen now, right? Great, okay. So before this was simply um, this introduction of the ROA and the regenerative organic, the description of regenerative organic and how we are defining it. So I'm gonna catch right back up to where I was. And this is talking about soil health and um, really just looking at the way that regenerative is going to um, bring in the health of the soil and looking at the fact that we're losing topsoil at unprecedented rates. And with regenerative practices, you can build healthy soil. And it's been proven time again, uh, each percentage increase in soil organic matter is the equivalent of 22,000 gallons of water that are retained in that soil. So you essentially turn the soil into a living sponge and it can just absorb the water. I, um, here in Northern California, we had these torrential rains and there were a lot of the regenerative organic farms were sharing images of the rain just seep soaking in on the vineyard and in the in the fields, whereas in neighboring farms, it was running off, taking the soil with it and creating all kinds of other problems. So, um, you know, it's, it's really a proven method is by keeping the soil covered, you can um, retain the soil and absorb the water. I just want to briefly point to the board of directors for the Regenerative Organic Alliance. And um, these are the people I answer to every, every day. And um, they've been really involved in helping me through the process once we launched the original, the earlier version of the Regenerative Organic Certified Framework. Um, we had many working groups and um, they all played a key role in helping us and, and still to this day are very involved in um, looking at our standards and how we are um, rolling out this framework. Um, we really believe that the organic farming has to include the animals and the humans. There are a lot of regenerative certifications that are popping up these days, and that's great. I don't want to, um, you know, that we don't want to discourage others from, from trying to enter into this realm, but we do worry about the potential for greenwashing when everybody is claiming regenerative, especially if they are, um, you know, if it's focused exclusively on sequestering carbon, um, we think that regenerative organic is more than just sequestering carbon or mitigating climate change. It's about undoing and reimagining our entire food system. As you all probably are well aware, the current farming and food system values cheap food over the well-being of all the other really critical players who bring um, who bring food to market and bring food to our table. And um, yeah, if, if, you know, we consider the last few years um, since COVID and what happened with farm workers and food system workers is that um, people who are vulnerable, they suffered disproportionately. And adding that harsh spotlight of COVID made it more evident than ever. And with our program, we aim for farm workers to be earning a fair or living wage and to have safe working conditions. And so this is really what sets our standard and our certification apart from other certifications. And we also want to bring, you know, have a product that can go to market where a consumer can go shopping and she or he can, or they can find a product that will address a whole suite of values that they bring into the store with them when they do their shopping. 
Um, to that end, you know, I want to just give you this comparison slide here as um, showing the difference between the different certifications. So um, as I mentioned, the USDA organic is a very strong, hard-earned designation. And I've seen really beautiful organic farms. I've also seen organic farms that are organic to the letter of the law and not a inch further. And in fact, they um, they they don't really speak to the kind of concept that we're talking about now of a holistic whole farm approach in a way that is not just extractive, but is regenerative. Um, so with USDA, um, you know, it does prohibit most synthetic chemicals and it prohibits GMOs and it prohibits antibiotics in the livestock. Um, it doesn't really prohibit the antibiotics in the livestock. You'll learn about this on your next session, probably with Certified Humane. Um, you have to treat an animal that is sick. You can't withhold treatment. But once you treat an animal with an antibiotic, it needs to be pulled out of the herd or the flock. Um, so also with the USDA organic, unfortunately, there is really little enforcement of the best soil health practices. There's nothing in there to say how many times a farmer may till or not till or how deep they can till. Um, so there's certain aspects of the USDA organic that don't allow the certifier to go far enough to ensure that that land is really being managed in a way that is regenerating the um, soil. Um, no limit, no um, conditions for farm worker fairness in the NOP and very, very limited rules for animal welfare. Regenerative, there in the middle, there is really no legal definition. So it's kind of the wild west out there. Most of them are focused on sequestering carbon. Um, oftentimes is going to indicate that the practices are aimed at increasing soil health. And of course we love that. However, there are problems where uh, most regenerative farms in the Midwest, there's no prohibition on using pesticides or GMOs. And um, there's nothing in there for social fairness typically. So. And uh, the Regenerative Organic Certified Program has all of these things and adds in layers in these other aspects like pasture-based animal welfare, social fairness for the farmers and the workers, and importantly is a buyer's criteria that's found in our framework. So any brands that are going to bring product to market with the Regenerative Organic Certified claim they have to answer to the buyer's criteria, which means they tell us, they, they are transparent in telling us, okay, we paid this premium. We have long-term contracts with these farmers, with our suppliers, so that we can ensure stability of those um, supply chains and ensure that the farmers are indeed getting a fair payment for their product. And that is quite different from most other standards. These, these are the three pillars. I've now mentioned them a few times, but um, if you take away anything today, those are the three pillars, soil health, animal welfare, and then the social fairness for the farmers and the farm workers. And we do this through um, these three pillars with all the different criteria that you see listed here, which I will not go into detail on. Uh, um, you are welcome to read those in our framework. Uh, I think you'll find um, a lot of common Kind of themes when you go to your certified humane next week uh, in the animal welfare pillar. And we actually recognize certified humane as a, a valid animal welfare certification. So if a farm comes to us with that, then it um, will basically address many of the criteria that we have in our animal welfare pillar. Um, here in the social fairness section, you can see all of these different criteria, um, good working conditions, living wages, which are very hard to um, to get to for most farmers, it's they don't themselves earn living wages. So this one's a real challenging area and we've learned a lot over the last three or four years of testing this out and gathering up the information. There's a um, there's global coalition for living wage. There is the MIT calculator. So you can actually go look up anywhere you are in the United States using the MIT calculator and put in your zip code and it'll tell you what the living wage should be for the area where you live. So our auditors are trained to use that and calculate that to make sure that the farm workers are earning something that is um, that is progressing towards a living wage. Um, we also have no forced labor, no child labor, um, capacity building at the farm, farm worker level. And um, 
if you see here, these are uh, these three levels of the regenerative organic certified. Um, the, each of these will require a different number and scope of regenerative organic practices. For example, the bronze, the farmers need to rotate like it just in the crop rotation criteria. They have to rotate three crops before they come back to the next, the crash crop. At silver, they have to do four. And at gold, they're rotating five crops before they come back to the cash crop. Um, other areas like with one of our criteria says that you have to have, you have to leave vegetative cover on the ground. So at bronze, it's gonna be 25 to 50%. At silver, 50 to 75. And for gold, it's 75 to 100% of the ground remains covered year round. And um, so those are some of the ways that we hope to help really encourage farmers to adopt more and more regenerative practices as they um, move along in their, in their learning and their trajectory on implementing this. Um, so as far as I mentioned earlier that we recognize certified humane, you see here, um, we, we have for soil health, the baseline that's required is USDA organic. If you have a commercial livestock operation, then we would require one of these animal welfare certifications, unless you are a dairy. We have developed our own criteria now for dairies because there were no viable options for dairies in the US for the um, animal welfare. So uh, this has been really interesting. We've learned a lot and we've grown a lot. We have about 20 regenerative organic certified dairies probably now in, in the pipeline. And so we're planning to do the same thing. We're gonna pilot a broiler, a poultry uh, standard for broilers uh, in the coming year, I hope. Um, the other one there on the right is the social fairness. So you can see here, we recognize the Ag Justice, um, Agriculture Justice Project certification, Fair for Life, Fair Trade International, Fair Trade USA, I believe you have on your agenda, and then some of these other ones. And Again, because there weren't a lot of great options for farmers operating in the global north, so this includes the US, Europe, Japan, Australia, we consider these countries more of the global north um, where we are able to offer the social fairness auditing um, without requiring an existing certification. Um, so someday we'll be able to also offer this in the global south, but at this point there seems to always be an option on the table for an operation who's in the global south to have one of these fairness certifications. And so, you know, we're just testing it out in the, in the global north. And once we get um, kind of more solid information and more guidance and more training for the auditors, then we'll probably expand that um, to offer it around the world. Um, so for you all, I wanted to include a few more details about how we revised our framework after we did the pilot program. So from 2019 to 2020, we uh, tested out the first framework from um, when they originally launched the, the organization in 2018. Uh, and we tested it out in eight different countries with 19 different farms around the world. Some of those were smallholders with 500 growers and others were small family farms. We had some Amish farmers. We had large to mid-scale farms in Canada and the US and a variety of different types of dairies and cattle operations. And so we had a lot of feedback after that process. And so we built, um, we built three task forces, advisory boards, brought in independent consultants. And then we had all these farmers weigh in from around the world, soil scientists, farmers, organic inspectors, animal welfare experts, fair trade experts. And um, they gave us a lot of feedback and we made changes and we revised the framework into what it is to, uh, we did a revision in October, 2020, actually just a minor cleanup. So that's the one that's on our website now. This year, we're going to be um, doing some more updates to the framework. And I'd say we'll probably aim to do it about every three years. You can find everything on our certification resources page. Um, this is, uh, there's just a lot of information here, probably too much information. Um, we're trying to do a better job at organizing this, but there's just a lot of documents that come into play when you're talking about developing a certification program that's very credible, that has rigor built into it, 
and that ensures that there's really qualified people going out and doing the work on our behalf because we don't go out and do the audits. We work with NOP accredited certifying bodies. We, we, um, they apply and we review and approve them. And then we train their auditors to, um, to go out and do this work for us. We have an extensive training program and um, auditors also have to have a pretty high level of competency and experience working in, um, especially in uh, soil health and crop. Um, I, I left these slides in and I'll, I'll kind of go quickly through these because I, I don't think that we want to get too deep in the weeds on this. And I believe your class ends in 20 minutes. So I want to make sure we leave time for questions. Um, so yeah, for the soil health, you can see here what we require. It's um, similar for the animal welfare. We want to see some formal education in a related field. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I worked with, I, I did the livestock team at uh, California Certified Organic Farmers for many years. We had a very small team of livestock inspectors. Only seven out of 75 inspectors um, were able to be on the livestock team because it requires a really specialized knowledge. But what we didn't have then, and I, I wasn't quite aware of it, we didn't have any formal training for animal welfare and none of us had the, any of these trainings. So in the last five years or so, since I left CCF, I've learned a lot and um, how animal welfare is not built into the NOP to the National Organic Program. And so it's really important to understand how to assess that and how to um, ensure that animals are being treated humanely. Same with the farmer and worker fairness. Oh my gosh, we've learned so much. It's really challenging. Technical NOP auditors do not have the background to do this. And this is something that has been um, an area where we really had to focus a lot of attention. We hired on people who had a deep uh, bench of experience in the social fairness realm and working with um, smallholders and farm workers around the world and doing special trainings for these auditors so they could learn how to work with this very vulnerable population and not jeopardize them by just in the way they ask questions or how an auditor would perhaps sum up the observations they made while they were on site doing the worker interviews could endanger a worker and could put them at risk of losing their job. Um, so it's, it's a really important aspect that we are going to continue to develop and, um, that's about it for that. Um, one differentiation I think I want to just clarify for you is the growers are certified because our framework is very much a farm level certification and it is based on the organic. So we know that once it gets to the processing plant, it's going to have full traceability and we aren't attempting to do the um, regenerative organic certified audits at a food processing facility. We are focused at the farm level. So a brand will get licensed to use the claim by buying regenerative organic certified crops from the farmers. And that's when we get to step in and say, okay, Navitas, how much did you pay for the cacao? What did those farmers earn from you? How are you helping build capacity in your supplier network? And please, and then we would also do an in-out audit, they call it, or a volume reconciliation audit. So we can ensure that all of the regenerative organic certified cacao powder, powder that they would be selling is indeed coming from the operation that we certify. Here's where we are today. Um, I was gonna make our goal for this year, a million acres, and um, that was back in December. And we have just certified some large operations in Australia and um, other countries, and we're at 721,000 acres. So I'm very proud of that. Uh, lots of different types of crops. We have, 57 different types of brands licensed and um, and a lot more farmers in the queue and coming in. Um, so we're going to be really, it's going gangbusters, I think, this year. It's going to be a really, really busy year for us um, trying to grow my team so that we can handle the constant flow of inquiries. It um, it never stops. It's a very, very busy place to be. Um, just wanted to show you some examples of some of the brands who are carrying regenerative organic certified products um, and you may find in your natural food stores near you or you can buy on Thrive online. Uh, that's right there, Thrive Market. Um, yeah, Whole Foods has been a really big supporter actually and Sprouts as well. 
And they're really helping keep the bar high because they are requiring any brand that makes a regenerative claim on the front label that they are getting certified by the ROA for our program or by Savory Institute for the land to market program. Um, these are some other beverages, lots of interest in coffee and wine in particular, two things I love. Um, textiles, we've got this going on with Patagonia, Prana, um, Terra Thread, and Madewell didn't make it on here, but we've got Madewell is going to be coming out with um, some products this year. And that is a wrap. So I'm going to end the slideshow and hopefully um, answer some questions for you all. Wonderful, Elizabeth, this is so fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing um, all of this information. This is really gonna um, broaden the students' understanding of not only ROC, but um, you know, I love the way that you described how ROC incorporates some of these other standards as baseline to kind of build in this more robust and holistic view for the certification. So we are going to open it up for questions. If you would like to pop your question into the chat box, that is an option. You can also raise your hand and Allie, if you could unmute um, any folks with raised hands who wanna ask their questions directly, that would be really helpful. And I just wanna say thanks to everybody whose comments I now see trying to help me that I couldn't, I couldn't see the PowerPoint, you couldn't hear it. I'm really sorry about that. It all, it all worked out and we got, we got things running smoothly. Yeah. <laughs> when uh, you go into the full screen mode, then you all disappear basically. So it's hard to see. Yeah. You're just kind of an, in a box by yourself. I know. I, it's not fun. <laughs> I like it when I can see people. Yeah. So any questions coming in? Otherwise, I always have a litany of questions for our speakers. I'll start like you. We do have uh, a hand up. Ellie, if you could unmute uh, Natalie, that would be great. Or Natalie, feel free to un feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Uh, hi, thank you for speaking today. I really appreciate uh, everything that you talked about. I have become really interested in agriculture over the past like five or six months, and I appreciate that you where even when you started just acknowledging like the land that you're on and that, that regenerative agriculture is not a new thing, you know, it's been been practiced by indigenous peoples for, you know, thousands of years. So yeah. uh, my question was just like, what do you, I feel like there's a lot of great work that regenerative organic um, certifications have, have done. Like, what do you think is the most meaningful part um, or a, a meaningful thing that you have been involved with lately? Thanks for that question. That's a great one. Um, I, I just was at uh, Eco Farm. Do, do you know about the Ecological Farming Association conference, Alyssa? It's oh man, it's so good. It's down in Monterey, California, every year around the third week of January. I'll just type it in here, and it's about three thousand farmers and activists, farmers and food activists, who come together and. There we go. And there are sessions all day long. At some points, like there's eight sessions and I want to go to six of them and you have to choose. And it's really tough. Um, I did a couple presentations there, tons of um, interest in regenerative and helping farmers. That's where we need to really focus the attention. Farmers need help. They have been tilling and using like weeds are the biggest problem for most farms. They're going to either use chemical termination or physical termination. With regenerative, it's like you don't actually need to do that, but you need to innovate around how do you, if you have a cover crop growing, do you roller crimp it and plant the seeds directly into that? And can those seeds emerge through the layer that was the cover crop? Or how do they use this kind of no-till method and control the weeds? So there were a ton of sessions about different ideas for implementing no-till using animals using the roller crimper method, using a variety of cover crops. So that was a really hot topic. And um, it was great to hear all the innovation that's happening. The um, part for me that was the most powerful though, is where I am learning about some of our clients and our farms who tell me that this is, last year was the first harvest season that they've actually put money in the bank. 
Okay, so most farmers go to work every day. And at the end of the year, the median farm income is negative $1,800. So that's across the country. It's not in every sector. And some farms are successful for sure. But most farms struggle. And they really struggle when we've got the kind of changing forces of nature and climate change happening. You've got massive droughts, massive floods, wildfires, tornadoes, like any number of kind of extreme weather event makes it really hard to farm. And so when I hear that farmers are doing well enough that they're putting money in the bank and their kids are are getting interested in coming back to the farm, that's the key. Because if we can get the next generation and people like you, Natalie, who are interested in food, and I'm not advocating that you go start farming. Trust me, that's why I work in the position I do, because I like farming's really hard and I want to support farmers, but I don't want to live off of farming because it's tough. But finding ways to support farmers and um, help with this kind of revolution. And as Yvonne Chouinard likes to say, the revolutions, they start from the ground up. So we are in a really good position for that, working with farming. Yeah, thank you. That was super cool. Um, yeah, farmers are so important. And it is very hard work. I have, I like volunteered at, we have a farm at, U, at UW and even working like a three hour shift, I'm like, I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tedious work. You know, it's hard on the body, a lot of bending over. It's also really joyful and beautiful to be outside all day. And I know farmers who wouldn't have it any other way and they wouldn't stand to be trapped inside behind a desk monitor like I am all day. That would be like a death sentence. But, you know, we all eat probably three times a day. You know, most of us in this room, I bet, get to eat and we get to choose what we eat two or three times a day. So how we choose is really important. And, and it's really powerful. It's because you get to choose to support things that, that um, can align with your values and can support your community and support farmers who are working like that. Excellent, thank you so much for sharing that Elizabeth and Natalie for your wonderful question. Do we have any other questions out there? And again, feel free to pop them in the chat or raise your hand and unmute yourself. Um, while we're waiting, Elizabeth, I have a question that's somewhat controversial. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, we heard from uh, Brenda Book, who's been with the Washington State Organics Program since its inception, and she kind of talked us through how that program got started and how that program in conjunction with others kind of led to the um, federal standard that we now currently have. Yep. Does the Generative Organic Alliance and or the certification have any sort of future goal to become a nationally recognized or even government run standard in a similar way, uh, sort of a similar pathway that the yeah. uh, organic standard has taken? It's it's a great question. And I, I was just asked this last week at a um, at EcoFarm presentation by an old timer who was there in the beginning. And he was like, you know, you need to make this a federal standard. Like, what are you going to do about that? And I said, gosh, you know, it's, it's tough. I, I also worked in organics for a long time and I understand how difficult it is. If things move at such an incremental pace. And then you could have like somebody like Donald Trump become the president and sign an executive order that removed all the work that had been done by the Animal Welfare Task Force for 10 years. They worked, they made recommendations, they got it through. It was put into law by Miles McAvoy from Washington State who was formerly WSDA, signed it into law, and then President Trump removed it. And so it's still being hotly debated. Animals under organic still are not living the life they should. Poultry is especially bad. And they just came out with this new version of it. And it's just too political. There's political football. And you can't be nimble, responsive to what's going on out there, like the learnings that are happening if you're having to change the law, it's just too laborious. So I don't think so, I don't want to. <laughs> but I think it's also important that we keep organic strong and we use that as the baseline and we don't ever let organic go away and we let organic keep getting stronger and it's happening. Just last week, the strengthening of organic enforcement passed and that is a huge achievement for the industry and it's gonna be great for all of us because it's going to make organic stronger. So that's where I would focus the attention and money. and. Um, all the work is going to be keep organic strong. And there's a lot of regenerative certifications. I'd like all of them to recognize organic is essential. 
I don't know if I'm going to get to that because we are still 1% of the farmland in this country. And 99%, we have 99% of those farmers to convert. So there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of challenge. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that perspective. We did have a question come in through the chat. Yes. This question was reflecting on the, the soil and the centrality of soil in the regenerative organic certification. They shared it was 30 soccer fields per minute of soil erosion. Is that globally or just in the U.S.? Are there certain areas that are suffering more from soil erosion? And I think that was kind of a geographic reference. Yeah. Um, so that it, quote is from Volker Engelsmann. And um, that came from, it's a global study for sure. He is based in Holland and he was working with some of the, um, I can't remember which publication it was in, but I used this a lot and I got it from, I'm trying to remember, I'm just looking in my old emails because it just came up recently. Um, this woman who's a writer for Forbes also uh, was using it and crediting it from, um, let's see, Isa Shabran. Either way, it's global, and his name is Volker Engelsman. So you could probably look him up and find it that way. And then the second part was, um, based on your perspective and the work you've been doing, are there certain areas that are struggling with soil erosion more than others? And maybe you can speak to kind of the U.S. and then if there's a, a global uh, focus as well. Yeah. Um, well, last week when I was in Monterey, I was driving through Salinas and um, kind of central California where you can see the subsidence. You can see the land going down and down and down. And it's happening all over the Imperial Valley, California, where we're overdrawing the water and we're tapping into those aquifers underneath and the soil is sinking. So that's one area. So I'd say in California, we've got a lot of issues with that. They, um, I was on a panel where there were some pretty large organic producers of vegetables. And one of them was incredibly courageous and kind of, he said, I'm sticking my neck out here by saying this, he said, but there is a scorched earth policy that is being embraced by all the organic producers in California who feed the nation. We send all of our greens all over this country. And um, what's happening is there is, because of the food safety concerns that happened around 2006, there was um, a very strong reaction by the industry to mitigate any risk. They um, basically stripped out any form of life from those farms. And so they took out all, all the hedgerows. They no longer planted cover crops with flowering, um, that flowers that bring in the beneficial insects because the beneficial insects might bring a bird, bird might poop on the lettuce, somebody gonna get sick. So they cleared out everything. And these farms are like um, wastelands. And he called it scorched earth policy, how everybody grows. And they have to because the buyers force them to. If you want it, Kroger wants to make sure their people aren't getting sick when they buy the chopped up lettuce in the bag. And so that's being forced upon the growers that they sign these leafy green marketing agreements that they have torn out all the hedgerows and they have no life on the farm. So that's a real problem that needs to be addressed. And I think those farms are really subject to a lot of erosion because the ground is not left. There's no cover on the ground at all. So that's one area. Um, and then I'd say like in the Midwest, we have massive farms that are growing GMO corn and soy back and forth, corn and soy, corn and soy. Maybe they throw in a little wheat or some kind of crop rotation, then they start calling themselves regenerative if they're going for Cargill or others. Um, so that that is also a problematic area. And a lot of that soil is washing off. And um, you know, a lot of a lot of the nitrogen that washes off from those farms feeds into the Mississippi River and it goes down into the Gulf of Mexico and creates huge um, dead zones. So there's problems everywhere, unfortunately. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. We did have another question come in through the chat uh, from Kaylin. Does the ROA ever approach farms to become regenerative organic certified or is it only based on their initiative to become certified? We can't even hang, we can't even keep up with the people coming in the door. So no, we do not have like a team going out and trying to enlist them. But um, we do have our partners at the Rodeo Institute. The uh, They started last year or like at the end of the year before last, they had two people on the regenerative organic consulting team. There's now 15 people. It's the fastest growing team at Rodeo. And so whenever um, there's a region or a pocket, an area that's ripe for conversion, they 
um, have a consultant who can go and help farmers on the ground learn to transition. And that's one thing we're trying to do is host more workshops, regional workshops, so we can demonstrate to the farmers. There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing more convincing to a farmer for them to transition to a new kind of farming than looking over the fence of their neighbor and seeing what she's doing over there. And if they see that she's successful and that she is bringing in, say, she's got a new tractor or she's got, you know, she's buying more land than she's being successful, then they they start to imitate. And so it's really the farmer to farmer movement is, is really impactful. Excellent. Well, we, we potentially have time for one more question. If anyone has one, just a couple minutes left in the session. Um, and while we're waiting, if one uh, does come in, that's great. Um, but I do just want to close out the session. This has been hugely informative, Elizabeth, and a wonderful building block that I think we'll we'll continue to look uh, back to. Like you mentioned, we've got Certified Humane next week. And after that, we'll hear from Paul Rice at Fair Trade USA. And so I think we're going to continue to reference your, uh, your a guest lecture for, for the rest of the quarter, for sure. And it's been just really fascinating to hear about all of the interest um, and really, I think, wonderful because as you mentioned, you know, IPCC uh, sites that we maybe have 60 or 70 more harvest, I mean, that's a, a shocking number. Um, yeah. It does require um, immediate action. So good to see that the action is, is following to a certain extent, at yeah. least um, in regard to the regenerative organic certification. It definitely um, is. And I think you'll really enjoy Paul Rice. He's been doing this a long time and um, has affected and helped a lot of farm workers. Um, I knew Paul long ago when I started working in coffee. Actually, he was just beginning his work. So our paths cross again. And um, I love that. And I just say one other thing for everybody to keep in mind um, in speaking of the fact that we've only got 60 or 70 harvests left and like the beauty of soil and the power of, of the soil, like um, my favorite, one of my favorite expressions is what we do to the soil, we do to ourselves. And so we look at what's in one teaspoon of soil. There are more organisms in one teaspoon of soil than there are humans on the planet. And that reflects the similar kind of diversity in our gut microbiome. And so, you know, we are very much a reflection of the soil, the diversity that is resides in that soil also resides in us. And so uh, it's important to take care of it. And learn more about it. So if you want to learn more about it, go to our in-field soil health tests. And they're very simple tests you can do at home. We filmed them right here in Northern California at a farm near me. And then we also did it in Sierra Leone with some cacao farmers, actually the ones that put the cacao in that bag that was in my presentation. Um, we did it with them and it was really fun process. We were doing it through WhatsApp and all kinds of ways of trying to do the filming. Um, but it was so loud from all the the wild, all the crickets and bugs in the forest that you couldn't hear the agronomist. So it was, it was great. So anyway, if you want to look at like aggregate stability in your own backyard, you can go there and learn how. That's excellent. And what a great place for folks to start um, doing that exploration if you haven't already. Okay, excellent. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for folks in our seminar. If you're at the 400 level, you've got another opportunity to turn in your reflection. Um, and otherwise, we will um, hope that everyone has a great weekend. And then we'll see you next week. We'll be hearing from um, Donnie Wilcox, who's in charge of sustainability at Wilcox Farm. So um, we'll be talking with a certified farmer. Um, and, you know, he's, I think, fifth generation on the farm. So we'll get to hear that perspective on certified humane and the other certifications that the farm uses as well. Um, so thank you so much, Elizabeth. We really appreciate all of your time and expertise. Have a great weekend, thank everyone. You. You'll have a great rest of your semester, reporter. Take care. <laughs>